Kate, you're a, a long-time listener of the Fitness and Lifestyle podcast. Uh, yeah. first, first time guest. Welcome yeah. to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for agreeing to come on the show. Um, I reckon today's episode is going to be a really, really powerful one and one that a lot of people get plenty of value from. Um, so thanks. But as I mentioned before, um, a big listener of the podcast, who, who's been some of the, the favorite guests that you've heard on the show so far? Oh, that's hard. Um, I loved the one with, um, oh, I loved all India Vines podcasts. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah, from your podcast that introduced me to her and, you know, got me to actually work some of her programs, which, you know, has really helped. Yeah. So every time she was on, I just, yeah, I listened straight away. Um, I'm just trying to think now. <laughs> put, me on the spot. put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, you definitely put me on the spot. Um, definitely Hugh Van um, Kylenberg from the Resilience Project. Yeah, um, sure. Loved, yeah, loved reading that book. So to hear him um, and his story and that it's just, it's all so inspiring. Yeah, anything to really do with the, the personal development, you know, how to better yourself and anything mindfulness as well. Yeah, um, yeah that all really intrigues me. Awesome. Now, I we'll, we'll obviously want to touch on in today's episode how health and fitness and particularly training and taking care of your nutrition and just your health in general, um, you know, how big of a role that's played um, so far. Um, in your recovery and then just in, in life in general as well with productivity and in regards to your job and work and everything. Um, but before we get stuck into all of that, uh, I'd love for you to kind of, if you're happy to, to share a little bit with the listeners about, um, I guess, your journey back to, to day one of, uh, of recovery, like what, what it kind of looked like prior to making the, um, making the decision to, to make some changes in your life? Like what, what kind of state were you in? Was there, was there like a, a low point? Was there something in particular that really changed the whole um, path for you in the first place? Yeah. Um, oh, it's like, it is a long story. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot, I guess I hit probably multiple rock bottoms. Um, I was in like from 2015 to 2019, I was in hospital eight times. Um, right. and that was all due to, um, my substance addiction. Um, majority of that was, um, painkillers. Okay. So it really had a massive effect on my, on my health in general, but mostly, um, like malnutrition. So I got incredibly skinny. I was down to 40 kilos for most of that time. Um, and I just, I wasn't ready to admit what was wrong. I think I was just always, um, you know, going with what the doctors were saying and they were trying to find something else. So I was trying to find something else so that I didn't have to stop. Yeah, okay. Um, I was just in such a bad headspace. Um, all I could ever think of was, you know, what was wrong with me? And um, I just didn't have any confidence in myself. Um, yeah, and I guess like one of my lowest points was, um, I think it was uh, November 2017 and um, I was in hospital again. I had to be put into emergency surgery. Um, I'd had a stomach ulcer that had burst. Um, I started getting stomach pains and didn't know what was going on. Um, it was like at five o'clock on the Friday night and my mum's um, partner came into my room and just, you know, saw me like, you know, ghost white. Um, you know, I could barely move. And so they drove me to the hospital and, yeah, I um I got you know pretty much put straight into emergency surgery. Had um I've still got like, this massive scar on my stomach, and that was the point that my family found out what I was taking and what was actually causing all of my health issues. Um, so up until that even, point, up until that point, it hadn't been um something that anyone really knew about. No, right. no, everyone everyone thought that it was you know that there was something you know. I guess that I was like making myself sick or that I okay. was anorexic or bulimic. Like everyone was trying to put a different label onto it or like, so I it was just, like an eating disorder type thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But in a way it wasn't because I wasn't concerned with body image. It was yeah. just, I was just in a, um, you know, I guess in a eating disorder from my substance addiction. So if you don't mind me asking, was there a, um, what was the, the reason in the first place for, I guess going, I mean, I don't, there's not always a reason for it, but, you know, going down the path of, of just using um, certain substances, like I think, as you mentioned, painkillers was, yeah. was what you're using. Like, was there a, 
uh, anything that triggered it in the first place, do you think? Or is that something that sticks out? Or is it, was it just like a bit of a slippery slope and, and you know, it kind of all happened um, without it, really understanding it? Yeah, it was a bit of a slippery slope. Like, I, um, I don't know. I guess I've always, um, you know, I, I did the whole binge drinking. I did all of that stuff through my 20s. And yep. I think everything about me was just like, I always wanted more. It made me feel more confident, which is something that I never felt when I was, you know, sober. And okay. so, and then I just wanted people to like me and, you know, yeah. all the people pleasing and feeling like I was never good enough. And then it was just like, at one point I was in a relationship that wasn't making me feel good. Um, changes were happening at work. I was in financial trouble and mm. it was just, it was something that made me not feel all of that stuff that was, you know, compounding on me. Right. And I mean, this, this, uh, this may be, I don't know if this is too much detail or whatnot, but like, are you able to give you an idea of like, you know, I know you mentioned to me like what you, um, like what you used to use is yeah. are you able to mention like what about like how, like how much to give people a bit of perspective of, uh, what they look like, or <laughs> probably you feel free not to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was quite a lot. I was, you know, I was taking like the over-the-counter painkillers um, that had the ibuprofen in it, and because yeah. I was taking a lot of them every single day, that's yeah. what caused, you know, a lot of, you know, problems within my gut. Okay. Um, and that's what caused, you know, me having to go into surgery. And yeah, yeah, and then. Yeah. And that decision after surgery. So, um, was that kind of a, you know, leave the hospital and then pretty much go straight into some form um, of rehab program or, or was there a bit of gap between there until you really realized? Cause I mean, from what I've heard, you know, listening to uh, different people's stories around uh, addiction, regardless of what it, what it actually is too. It's almost like a early days. Anyway, it's almost like a, your brain does whatever it can to, to mask the fact that there is an issue in the first place. Like you try and almost make up a bunch of excuses and reasons as to why, why you're using um, so much or, or so often to justify why you're doing it. So is it, were you, even when you, when you went, obviously the, the fact that you had surgery is a, is a big wake up call, but like when you went into the recovery program, were you under the impression that there was not an issue and you were just doing it to please like to, just to make sure that everyone else was, was happy or were you kind of, had you made the decision realizing that it had finally become an issue? Well, I got clean in 2019. So that probably tells you there that it took me a while to actually get to that point. Yep. Um, in after, you know, the surgery and that hospital visit. What year was the uh, surgery? Uh, 2017. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I did, um, you know, counseling, um, AOD, which is alcohol and other drugs counseling at the local health center in, um, in Gippsland. Yep. Um, and yeah, like I would, I did that because like, that's what my family wanted. That's what I guess the people in hospital recommended. Um, and I found that I was just, I wasn't ready or I just wasn't willing to accept that um, I had this major issue that I could stop. And, you know, my brain would just start thinking of all these ways to try and control everything. So I didn't end up back in hospital. I thought, well, yeah. you know, I know what not to do now. Like I know that, um, you know, I can reduce the amount or I can have a day off here or, you know, try to control things. And, um, you know, at the time the doctors had prescribed me this antidepressant that had, you know, it was making me gain weight. Okay. Yeah. So, all of 2018, I was pretty much masking the fact that I still had a problem because I actually gained weight and started yep. to look the part, look like I was okay. On the surface, I looked okay. On the inside, I was still, you know, I was still broken. I was still, you know, feeling like shit and, yep. um, you know, thinking I, I knew best and I could control everything. Yeah, that's interesting. So, after 2017, took another two years till you till you got sober, till you got clean. What was the um, turning point there? Like, what what made you make that decision? And then also, what does that process look like? Um, yeah. I think, yeah, like how does how does the whole recovery journey start? Yeah, um, in 2019, the first six months, um, I was in hospital again three times, and um, the last time was around Mother's Day in um, 
yeah, in 2019. And um, yeah, my family had pretty much tried everything that like I put so much stress and so much worry on them. And they were the ones that that pushed me to say to go into rehab and to seek help from, you know, outside sources and outside the area because they mm. just couldn't help me anymore. Yeah. And, um, you know, in a way that was me people pleasing because I, I did all of that for them. Um, yeah. You know, I, um, I sought treatment. I went in there and it actually took me a couple of weeks of being in there to try to switch, like to actually switch my thinking that I needed to, you know, stop doing this for other people and do it for yourself. Do it for me. Mm. What does the, just for everyone, so for those that are unaware of how the whole um, rehabilitation or, or recovery program works and, and it may be different for, for the you know, the one that, that you've done, like is there a set standard that, that goes across pretty much every recovery program across the world or is the one you went to different to others? Or And, and then how does it look like right from the beginning? Because I, I can imagine it would be quite, um, I guess, daunting right at the start to kind of, one, you've made the decision in the first place through the first few weeks, as you said, you, you're still thinking that you're kind of doing it for other people and not so much yourself. What, what does that look like in terms of taking those very first steps at the beginning? Um, so every, every recovery journey is different. I mean, yep. some people go into rehab, some people just go to, um, you know, 12 step fellowship meetings from the start. Um, you know, everyone's decision is different. Um, mine just ended up being um, through a rehab because I just, I couldn't, do it on my own um and so the start of that for me looked like you know just giving giving that facility a call and the first person i spoke to had 17 years clean and sober and Unreal. Um, that like she was really kind and you know and caring and just said that you know i was doing the right thing and that i'm doing okay and even though i couldn't get in there for another month or six weeks yep. you know, i just called to check in every single week and um you know it made me i guess feel a bit more um secure in in what i was doing and that, had some accountability there as well yeah and but that someone there understood um you know as much as my family were supportive um, everything they were saying, I was taking as, you know, oh, there's something wrong with me. Like, um, yeah, yeah. I'm not good enough for them. Like why, why can't I be good enough for my family? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and throughout this whole process, uh, I want to touch on a little bit more at some point, just about how the actual, um, even the 12 step process, like how, how that works. But, um, what, what do you think has been some of the most important tools or characteristics of the whole recovery is it you know i had I had written some things down like which i assume would be really important things along the lines of communication as i said before accountability um even having a plan or, or like a specific goal in place what what have been some of the most important parts of it in terms of making sure you stay on track but um not to stay on track but also thrive in whatever whatever you choose and do whether it be the health and fitness stuff or work or whatever yeah so communication and connection is key um yep. you know in my in my addiction i isolated myself and i didn't let anybody in i wasn't honest mm -hmm. so um you know being able to to share what i was feeling with other people and for them not to judge me and to actually you know get a sense of okay if i if i'm honest you know maybe people won't reject me um mm -hmm. So that connection has been key. I think there's a, um, there's a saying that always goes, you know, connection is the opposite of addiction. And, you know, that's okay. been, you know, really, really true for me. Um, but also just keeping things in today, like, you know, keeping things in the moment. Um, you know, what happened yesterday has already happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't worry about what happens tomorrow. Like, what can you do today? Yeah. Um, you know, even if it's like hour by hour, minute by minute, um, you know, just, yeah, work, like focus on what you can do today. Try and be um, present as much as you can. Yeah. 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 Um, and gratitude has been a massive one for me. Mm -hmm. um, when I first got into, into the rehab, um, every single night at our um, evening meeting, we had to um, say something positive about our day and we had to say something positive about somebody else. 
you know, what somebody else achieved or did. Um, and that was to end the, end the day on a good note, no matter mm. what happened, you ended the day on a good note. And, um, you know, I carried that with me when I got out and, um, you know, that became part of my journaling practice. Yeah. And yeah. Even How long? Feel, or even if I didn't feel the gratitude later yeah. on. I did. did. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Gratitude so extremely powerful. As you mentioned, you know, people like Hugh and, and whatnot who have been on the show and for any content that people have consumed around gratitude is so important. Something that I obviously do every morning and night as well. We, how long are you in the, um, the rehab facility for? Um, six weeks. Six weeks. Okay. And then the 12, like, I don't know a, a great deal about the 12 step program. So is that, um, I'm obviously aware of it, but I'm just not sure how, how it works. So do you start that while you're in the, the rehab facility or is that something that you do separate to that once you get out? And then also what are you able to share a bit about what the actual 12 step process is? Um, so I was introduced to, um, to the meetings and to the fellowship through the rehab. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you get asked to share. And I think for the first five weeks, I was too afraid to share. Like I was too scared. I was, you know, too inside. I was just inside my own head um, thinking what I was going to say. And, you know, if I said something, what were they going to think of me? And, um, you know, it was just, it was something that actually caused me a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it was the very last week. Um, I thought if I don't, if I don't share, if I don't speak now, then I'm never going to. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of changed everything for me because I just, I became, I just went to be the first person to share so that I would yep. get over that anxiety mm. and just get it over and done with. And um, yeah, that, that allowed me to, I guess, you know, speak more later and become part of that fellowship when I got out. Because the thing I could see from it, even if I was, you know, inside my own head and I was overthinking and didn't pay attention a lot at the start, I, I could just see that people were able to stay clean outside of a facility. And that was something I could never do. They were able to get a good life. They were, you know, mm. I... Um, you know, I think back to two years ago and I, you know, I was living at my mum's. I had no job. Um, you know, I didn't really have anything. I, you know, didn't have any money, nothing. It was, um, you know, I've essentially had to rebuild my life in two years. And, mm. you know, when I look at where I am now, it's, you know, it's amazing, but it wouldn't be without the help of other people, you know, within the rooms and, yeah, um, yeah within those meetings and just being able to connect with them. Yeah, no, you've done, I mean, from the outside in, you've done an incredible job. I think when we first met and you started training with me, it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but it must have been within what, the first six months of of being yeah. clean, I think. Yeah. yeah. And since then, obviously, you, recently you've clocked up two years, which is um, which is a huge achievement. And and as you've said, made incredible progress um, in all areas of life, but from, from the outside in anyway. So, Along the journey so far, and um, I want to move soon into into the whole health and fitness side of things and the impact that's had. But what has probably been, um, if you're happy to share, the the most difficult part of the recovery process so far, aside from obviously early stages, I would assume, like not using, um, mm -hmm. in terms of other other areas of the recovery side, what has been probably the most difficult thing for you so far? Um, I think you know. <laughs> I guess dealing with life, like dealing with things that happen in life that happen every single day that I used to just mask with, you know, with taking a substance, things like in, um, was it March last year, I had a car accident mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it was actually like a pretty big car accident because my car was written off. Um, but you know, at the time I was alone, um, you know, nobody was hurt, but my head, like started to go to all this, you know, doom and gloom, like oh, my, on my own, I don't, you know, um, nobody's here for me. And um, my mind just quickly shifted to, you know, I've got a phone full of numbers that I can call. Um, I, you know, I've got out of the, you know, accident unscathed. Like I only had a little cut on my lip and yep. nobody else was hurt. The yep. only thing that was hurt was my car. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it's something, I guess, that, doing you know things like the gratitude um you know connecting with other people that sort of stuff helped 
um, you know, I've had other little triggers and things like that that have come up, things like um, when COVID first happened um, and we were forced into lockdown. Yeah. You know, being isolated, you know, makes me think of what I was like before. Yeah. And so it was like having to work extra hard at staying connected. Mm -hmm. Has it been, um, even to this day, like it's been two years, is it still difficult now? Like, I'm not sure. Do you still have like days or times where um, it crosses your mind to, to, to use any substance or is that a kind of, do you feel like you're past that now and it is only these major things that kind of potentially trigger the, the feeling to do that or, or is, are you in a different, different place now? Um, at this stage, I'm, you know, I don't really have the desire to use anything and yep. it doesn't really come up. Um, I think in the early days when, you know, you'd see other people having a drink and, you know, you were socialising, all of that stuff, you know, started to become hard. And I would think about all these elaborate excuses as to why I couldn't drink or I would, um, you know, buy a non-alcoholic drink that looked like something that, you know, yeah. other people would drink because like, to fit in. And at the moment, I'm, you know, I just say I don't drink. I'm, you know, and I'm becoming more comfortable in talking mm -hmm. about it. Um, you know, obviously by, you know, posting things on social media or, um, you know, even by doing this podcast, you know, just yep. being open about what I've been through because I actually now become proud of what I've been through. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. Is there, um, something that I always wondered, I mean, obviously the reason that you went in in the first place was, um, was painkillers. Does, uh, as part of the program, um, like, do you have any, like, do you have any desire to uh, have a drink ever again? Or is that something that would trigger you to want to do um, the use painkillers or is it just in general, like once you, once you're in the program, it's completely nothing. Um, it's, you know, a program of abstinence. So, um, you know, I don't see myself, you know, drinking again. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, right. um, yeah, it's something that, you know, I guess I had to get over that stigma of, you know, oh, it's like socially acceptable, all of that. But um, I don't know. I don't miss it right don't have now. have a desire to do it, yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. Um, so so talking about the health and fitness side of things, it's obviously played a huge, huge role um, for you. Prior to the start of your um, recovery process, were you doing any form of, um, of training at all? Like, were you in the gym? Were you playing any sports or anything like that? And, and what actually, um, made you, you know, start in the first place if, if you weren't doing anything before? Yeah, I did absolutely nothing. I think some days I was lucky to get two or 3000 steps, um, right. in the day. So I, I, I was so lazy and the only times I would go to the gym, um, I think I would go for six months and then I'd give up and, you know, or two months. Um, I think I was very, you know, instant gratification, you know, yep. wanting things right here, right, right now. now. Yep. And yeah. And didn't want to put in the work. Um, but you know, being, um, being in the rehab, we actually did a lot of walking. We, you know, did a lot of, um, like manual labor tasks and things like, you know, gardening and, you know, just different things. Like, Cause I was in, you know, a rural area. Um, we just did so much and, you know, started to get my activity level up. And when, when I got out, um, my sister who'd, who'd been trying to get me to go to, um, the local gym in Morwall, um, yeah, she she got me to go there and I started doing personal training at the yep. start because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Um, so I did that for a couple of weeks and then I joined in on their classes and um, it was the end of that month. It was in October. I ended up moving to Melbourne. So that's when I started to come to progression. Yeah, that's unreal. And I mean, fast forward to, um, to today and you're an absolute weapon. Uh, <laughs> punching out PVs every week and, um, and <laughs> give, give, do you want to give the, the listeners a bit of an idea of what your, your week looks like now in regards to the, the training side of things. And this is not to say that everyone needs to, you know, for everyone to, to feel the same as what Kate feels that you need to train as much as this, but just, you know, you mentioned before you used to do nothing. So what does a typical week look like for you now in terms of training? A typical week is, um, <laughs> 
you know, about five or six days training and strength training. So yep. um, I prefer that over cardio. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to get me to run is, yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> I start running and then I end up stopping because I just, yeah, I, I absolutely just love the strength training. It's great. Um, cardio things like I will probably do in a group setting or in a class because, um, I don't know, I find I, I push myself with other people and... Yep. But strength on my own, I can just, you know, I can get that done. And especially through lockdown, I can get it done, you know, just behind me in my living room. So, um, mm. shout yeah. out to progression fitness there. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> shout out to progression fitness there. Absolutely. Um, you know, that helped me a lot. And I yeah. think like being part of, part of that group at the start, you know, just, I guess it just helped with that, that connection, that community feeling. Community vibe. Yeah. Yeah. And feeling like I belonged because, you know, that's been a big part of, um, of my recovery is feeling like I belong. And I started to feel that in all the different settings that I started to become part of, like whether it's the 12 step fellowship, whether it's, you know, the progression fitness community, you know, work, um, you know, my family, um, friendship circles, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, gaining, I guess, that confidence within myself and, you know, showing up as who I am, not who um, I think people want me to be. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm able to feel that, that belonging a bit more. Um, but yeah, back to, I guess, like the, you know, typical week, you know, I, um, I don't know, I, I find it really hard to take a rest day and yeah. I think you know, <laughs> I probably feel- a lot of, a lot of people can relate, but um, I know that it's good for me. And I think a rest day for me will look like, you know, um, a yoga session. Um, you know, I've been doing a really beautiful yoga session every Saturday um, with this girl, Phoebe. And um, it's just something that that helps me mentally as well. Um, and it's a bit, that's a bit more of a, a mindfulness thing um, just to help me with, I guess, my, um, my recovery yeah. as well. Fantastic. And nutrition obviously plays a huge role. You know, people often talk about how nutrition is, is medicine, you know, the, the way, the way that you eat, um, you know, ultimately can determine how you feel, how you look, how you perform, all that type of stuff. So how important has the nutrition side of things been for you? And, and, um, you know, obviously you're a bit of a fruity, you love cooking and stuff as well. Um, you make some pretty incredible different creations and, and stuff like that. But, when did the nutrition component um, become, I guess, important for you? And then how much of a role do you think that's played not only in, um, in your physical health, but even mental health as well? Yeah, nutrition's been incredibly important for me. Um, you know, it's funny you say it's like medicine. Mm. I remember a doctor mm. telling me, um, you know, four years ago, you know, food is your medicine. You know, he didn't, you know he said like, just eat, you know, um, yeah. at the time it's hard to say that to someone that's got stomach pains and everything. But, yeah. Um, yeah. It's played a massive, massive role. I've always loved cooking. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, it, like when I was at my lowest, it wasn't like I didn't want to eat. I wanted to eat. I just couldn't actually, you know, stomach it like my stomach. stomach yeah. Yeah. Flare up and, and all that. But, um, as soon as I, you know, I guess, you know, put down the substances um, and yeah, started to actually eat normally, like um, it, like things just changed, um, mm-hmm. you know, things like my hair growing, um, you know, nails, all of that stuff, like actually started, started to help. And like I started to actually feel more healthier when I ate and, you know, I was taking like so many different vitamins and supplements every single day. And I guess one of the, you know, high points for me over the last, you know, year is being able to stop, um, you know, taking a lot of vitamins because I'm actually getting all of it from my food. Food, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I had a lot of gut issues um, because of what I was using and ended up having to see a nutritionist last year just to heal my gut. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's um, like I experienced just a lot of gut pain because I experienced a lot of trauma in the past and because I was clean, everything was just catching up. So, um, yeah. you know, it was good to be able to use nutrition as a way to help and heal my body 
instead of trying to use a substance to try and, you know, I guess, kill the pain. Yeah, 100%. Now, I feel like in regards to the recovery um, journey, it's very similar to, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel as though it's very similar to the training and nutrition component as in like it's a, it's a working progress. It's something that needs to be kind of taken care of every day or at least every week. Um, what type of commitments do you still have and do now um, with, the, with the recovery side of things? Are you still doing sessions each week? I know you mentioned to me that you, you run some sessions now as well, which is awesome, but um, how much of a time commitment are you putting in each week? to to take care of that yeah um so like i try to attend about three meetings a week um i you know i have someone that you know is, is essentially my mentor in the program and now i actually do the same thing with another woman i've just taken awesome. um, yeah take another woman under my wing um over the last month and um you know it's essentially just giving back what was you know freely given to me um yeah. And, you know, it's the whole thing of, you know, of service, of being of service to other people. And then, you know, something that, you know, just helps me is watching other people grow. Yeah. Um, you know, which I know would have been the same for other people watching me, you know, in the early days. Um, and just, you know, being a part of it. And I mean, last night I was at a meeting and someone had celebrated 46 years clean. Like that is incredible. Uh -oh. So unreal. So even at that point there that this individual and I don't know if it's the same for everyone, but she's still, he or she is still attending meetings yeah. 46 years in. 46 years in. And, you know, that's what, um, 10 years, like more like older than me. Like, you know, he's been clean, you know, 10 years longer than I've been alive. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Crazy. Yeah. Is that, is that pretty typical for people who have been on that journey for, for that long to still do the meetings or is this a bit of a, an outlier compared to others? Like, is there an expectation or um, almost a recommendation that um, you continue to do the sessions year after year, regardless of, of how long you've been sober for? Um, I think it will depend on the person. I mean, you know, the whole thing is about it is to help another addict like um you know that's the that's the primary purpose of the fellowship is you know one person helping another and you know you end up just i think it's like your first year is for you and everything after that is for everybody else um and i don't know it's um i guess it it just it depends on the individual but mm. it's just it's always incredible to see because no matter what, I, I, I intend to stay in there because yeah. I've always got something to learn and I've all, I'm always going to grow by doing that, um, you know, and the challenges and everything that comes up, you know, the relief I get from just sharing it with somebody else that, yeah. you know, yeah, it's incomparable. What is the... Uh the some of the, some of the best tools that you picked up along the way you know on this show um as you know i often talk about just in general about adding tools to your toolkit particularly whether it be physically or um or mentally so physically obviously is knowledge around training and, and nutrition but mentally i often talk about things like meditation and journaling and and whatnot so throughout your uh journey so far what has been some of the most effective tools that you've been able to add into your day-to-day -day routine or even just weekly routine to to help with the process yeah um so meditation has played you know played a huge role for me um i i didn't really connect with it at the start i think it's all the things like same with gratitude you know you practice it every single day and it's just like um it's essentially like training you know yeah. um eventually you know something will click um, you know, for me, I do, you know, 10 minutes in the morning and, um, cause I use the daily calm app and it leaves me with a question at the end that I then journal on. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that gives me, it gives me something to reflect on. Um, you know, I write in the morning, three things I'm grateful for at night. I write three things I'm grateful for and I reflect on my day. Yeah. Um, and what I do is I actually, you know, it's part of the accountability, I guess I send it out to a group of people. You know, I send my my gratitude out um, to a group of people. So, um, and then they send theirs to me. So, Just as an, an accountability type of thing. Yeah, and yeah. it's something that keeps us all connected. Um, mm -hmm. And 
you know, um, like then when you pick up the phone and you talk to somebody, you sort of like know what they're going through. And, you know, you can get a sense of, you know, if you don't hear from a person, you can reach out and go, oh, is everything okay? Um, and yep. I think like one of the biggest things is for me is, you know, just, I guess, knowing that it's okay to ask for help when I need it. Um, you know, I, I never used to ask for help. I would try to take on everything myself and yep. be too afraid to. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. Outside of the, you mentioned before, like some of the um, times, I guess, where, uh, you may have felt, particularly throughout lockdown and whatnot, you may have felt like uh, alone or, or trigger, triggering times that have been quite difficult. Outside of those, what has been um, the most difficult part of the journey so far? You know, things that pop into my mind, maybe things like, you know, reconnecting with people that maybe you lost connection with before or, or having tough conversations. Like what has been kind of some of the one of or some of the standout moments that have been super difficult um, but in saying that after you've done it, it's really opened up, um, opened things up for you, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, so earlier this year, I um, had to get a tooth pulled from the dentist. Yeah. And, um, you know, at the time it felt okay because I was, you know, obviously they, you know, numb your mouth, everything like that. As soon as that wore off, the pain was just excruciating. Like oh, it shit. Was, I can imagine. <laughs> Teeth are the worst. <laughs> oh, it was horrible. And, you know, obviously at the time, like I said, no, nah, you cannot, you know, pres- do not prescribe me any painkillers. I'll just have to take Panadol. I can't even take ibuprofen because of my stomach issues. And so I, you know, just asked for all these like different like remedies of what to do. You know, none of that really helped i just had to, deal, had to deal with the pain it was like a couple of hours the first one when it was you know just excruciating um you know i reached out to call, like call other people um but it's like funnily enough like i just decided oh, i'm going to go out for a walk and you know i went out for a walk i got home and i started to feel just a little bit better like the pain was still there yeah but a lot of it was in my head you yeah. know it was yeah. i'm in so much pain and i was overthinking it yeah, I can imagine that'd be, and that, that can turn into a bit of a vicious cycle. On the the opposite side of that, um, you know, just before we we kind of wrap things up, like what has been for you probably like the most enjoyable or um, positive or happy moment for for you so far since you have been um, clean? Um, I would have to say just playing with my nieces and being present with my family. Um, you know, we like my. My um, youngest niece, um, Lexi, she was born in lockdown last year. And um, so I didn't get to meet her for like a month and a half. And yeah, then, I remember that. yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so I saw her for a little bit. And then it was four or five months after that before I could see them again. And like, I remember the first uh, in November last year, I was, you know, finally able to go and see them. Um, I think the day we got out of, you know, we we're all the ring of steel around Melbourne was lifted. I was straight on a train and back to, back to Morwell, back to see my family. And, um, you know, my niece, my niece Miller, um, she's three now. She was doing, she was obsessed with doing like the ring a ring a rosy, like, you know, running around in circle. <laughs> yeah. And like, I was doing that with her. So I was just like dancing around with her. And that for me is just something that's so precious. Yeah. Hundred percent. That's uh, that's that's awesome. Uh, well, look, Kate, it's uh, it's been a really, really enjoyable chat. I think um, I think everyone that's tuned in would agree with me and uh, have taken taken a bit away from today's episode. I mean, like I said to you, um, I've said to you numerous times before, but even at the start of this episode, um, from the outside in, you've done an incredible job so far, and um, as as I'd imagine, it's only beginning. So keep doing what you're doing you're doing awesome an awesome job and and a big thanks for coming on the show as well because i know you've only done um a couple of these before and you mentioned before we started you were quite nervous so um you smashed it did a good job thank you thanks so much for having me pleasure now you can listen to yourself on the podcast <laughs> I doubt I will. <laughs> uh thanks thanks so much kate and for everyone who's tuned in um we really appreciate the fact that you listened to this episode today so um It'd be awesome if you could take a screenshot of this show, post on your Instagram story for us, tag myself, tag Kate. Um, I'll have Kate's social media um, in the show notes as well. Um, so thanks again, Kate. And thanks everyone who's tuned in today.